The General Dynamics cruise missile is uniquely adapted to operation from submarines. Here is a typical launch sequence. The wings and fins must be stowed within missile contour. The fins are covered by a shroud. The entire missile is loaded into a protective capsule and is then handled as a normal torpedo within the torpedo room. It is loaded into the torpedo tube, tube closed, and flooded down. The missile is then ejected using the normal hydraulic ejection system on the submarine. The missile booster is ignited in front of the submarine and the missile proceeds up to the surface. Meanwhile, a second hydraulic ejection ejects the capsule. In air, the shroud is ejected, fins extended, providing roll control for the missile during boost. At booster burnout, the air breathing engine inlet is extended, assisting the booster ejection function. The air breathing engine is then ignited, the wings extended, and the missile accelerates and turns toward the target achieving cruise flight. I'd like to take this opportunity to give you an update of the cruise missile program here at Convair. We're moving now from the design, the theoretical paperwork phase into the hardware-oriented phase. Our hardware work now is being directed towards supporting our structural test vehicle, our captive flight program, and our boost test vehicle. Our design now is going from the layout stage uh, into detailed design. And in support of the layouts, we've taken a little bit of a different approach on the program in that we are using what's known as a design aid. This design aid is actually an adjunct to our layout procedure where the engineer, as he's making the original layout, has in parallel this paper, cardboard, foam, design aid being built, which tends to minimize his task relative to defining access, routing, wire harnesses, tubing, cabling, and so forth. And we found that this really speeds up the process. When the engineer is through with the design aid, we have found that manufacturing, planning, uh, maintenance, and other groups make use of the design aid in their portions of the program. And now we'd like to take you and show you some of the details of our testing program and our fabrication program, emphasizing the hardware aspect that we're now in. As you can see, many of our components are submerged in fuel in the vehicle. And many, many months ago when we started this program, we were concerned about the compatibility of the material with the fuel. And we have run various insulations, materials, components in the fuel over a cumulative period of some 13 months, selecting those with the highest compatibility with the fuel and rejecting those which appeared to have undue swelling or other deterioration. We think now that we have identified the best materials for the cruise missile, and uh, we are using those in our design work. A series of tests were run at Williams Research Corporation using an early version of the fan engine and JP9 fuel. The objectives of these tests were to identify any smoke trail that might be left by the engine, its IR signature, its noise signature, and its visual signature at night. There was no perceptible smoke trail except during an early engine transient during startup. The IR signature directly up the tailpipe was well within the threshold. The off center line IR measurements are not valid because the engine's slightly different in configuration. The noise amounted to about 119 dB at 50 feet from the engine. The visual signature at night consisted of a dull glow around the engine annulus. One of the more stringent requirements for the Navy cruise missile is the requirement to sustain pre-launch shock loads when stowed in the submarine. 
We have recently completed a series of drop tests wherein we took a short section of missile and capsule, and by dropping it from a predetermined height, we simulated the actual shock loads. In these tests, we used a 688-class submarine support dolly, and we subjected the test specimen to up to 150 Gs of shock load. During these tests, we measured instantaneous pressures and accelerations. No damage was sustained in the test specimen during these tests, and it tends to confirm our stress analysis and our detailed design of missile and capsule. We have just completed a series of low-speed tests in our tunnel, which uh, verify the various launch configurations of the missile, including booster on, booster separation, wing deployment. These data now confirm our low-speed launch performance and give us a solid base for our upcoming boost test vehicle flights from San Clemente Island. These are some high-speed motion pictures taken during our fin deployment tests. The objectives of these tests were to verify the dynamics of the unfold, the latching mechanism, and also to measure the loads reaction on the actuator itself. These tests prove that our mechanism worked satisfactorily and the actuator loads were within the design limits. Other than some minor changes in the method of attachment between the Lexan outer portion of the fin and the aluminum inner portion of the fin, we consider these tests to be highly successful. In order to improve our range performance, reduce the inert weight of the vehicle, and reduce the cost, we have been tested in our high-speed wind tunnel to prove out the deployment sequence and the structural integrity of the concept. To further verify our hydrodynamic predictions, we have run a series of underwater tests at the Lockheed Test Facility. The main objective of these tests is to identify the interaction between the thrust vector control, that is the nozzle plume, and the base area of the missile to identify any possible underwater control anomalies. Most of the detailed structural design is now complete and has been released to the shop for detail manufacture. Typical of these detail parts is this engine mount ring, which is a numerically controlled machine part. And there's a great deal of these parts now in the shop in manufacture. We're now getting to the next phase of the program where we're actually assembling detailed parts into major structural assemblies such as this tail cone. This tail cone is for the captive flight vehicle and incorporates this engine mount frame at this plane. In the production of our detail parts, we're using many varied techniques. Numerically controlled machining, pattern following machining, electron beam welding, TIG welding. Many of these processes will be used in both the prototype and production versions. Others will be changed as we proceed into the production program to make them more economical. One of our most ambitious uses of the numerical control machine on the cruise missile program was for the production of the basic wing structure. In this application, we start with a rather sizable piece of raw stock and completely machine the entire internal structure of the wing. We use both straight line cuts and of course wing contour cuts. We feel that in production this use of numerical control will greatly reduce the cost of producing wings. The production of body skins involves in the prototype a series of skin machining and rolling processes. The skin is first machined in the flat using numerical control techniques. It is then filled with rigid X 
to give the upstanding legs sufficient support so that it can be rolled to the contour of the missile. After rolling, the voids are filled with rubber in preparation for the age sizing process. The part filled with rubber is placed in the die and then in the oven for the age sizing. The rubber expands in the die, forcing the skin material against the die, giving us a very good reproduction of contour. A typical example of numerical control machining is the engine mount frame. This is the five-point mount frame, which is actually a canted bulkhead in the missile and is an example of utilization of numerical control to save many, many individual operations. In some cases, rather than use numerical control techniques, we use pattern follower techniques, which give us more flexibility and ability to change the part as we proceed into the manufacturing process. Electron beam welding is used in many areas where we want to minimize the heat affected zone and therefore minimize any chance of distortion in the welded part. Since most of the parts are 20 inches in diameter, lathe turning is a basic method of finishing not only the interior of the body sections, but of course the exterior and making sure that the body sections are true and round, giving us our required uh, close tolerance fit in the capsule. While we are using these techniques on the prototype missiles, we are also studying other techniques to substitute in many areas to cut down the manufacturing cost of the production missile. Another of the areas that we're working in is the survivability aspect of the cruise missile, wherein we're investigating radar cross-section, IR signature, and visual signature. In the area of radar cross-section, we've been developing a radar absorbent nose, radar absorbent inserts in the inlet, and generally achieving a vehicle which is within the radar cross-section threshold. Much of the development and diagnostic work has been done using Fort Worth Division's short pulse facility. The combined infrared and visual signature requirements have indicated the need for a coating material on the missile. We have been developing such a coating material that achieves the combined requirement between visual and IR signature. This is a proprietary coding process. We're able to consider this type of survivability approach or, or signature reduction approach because of our encapsulation. We can safely coat the missile and store it in the capsule in its in operational environment and be assured that the coating will be functional when the missile is launched. We have built a simple electromagnetic pulse model of the missile, and this missile model is currently under test. In these tests, we're looking for the efficiency of the joints and doors in protecting the internal components from the effect of an electromagnetic pulse. We are using a computer model which we have developed to actually simulate the encounter of a cruise missile with a Soviet radar. In this simulation, we're able to vary all of the significant parameters, such as the radar cross-section of the missile, the altitude, the type of terrain, the uh, reaction time, and in this way we have an accurate model of this 
encounter and we can demonstrate the survivability of our cruise missile. We are able to demonstrate not only the current capabilities of Soviet defenses, but are able to extrapolate the situation into the 1980s. We have given you some insight into our design, test, and manufacturing work in support of our schedule on the cruise missile. The next major activity will be the assembly of major test vehicles and the checkout of these vehicles. We will be giving you a film report on this activity in the near future.